it is always a great pleasure to be here in a university and to be back uh, again among those who are pursuing scholarship. So, Rector, Dean of the Faculty, Professor McCourt, uh, thank you very much for your, your kind words. Uh, let me thank you for the invitation to be part of your symposium. May I thank Rettore Fabiani, Franca Ruggieri, John McCourt, Enrico, uh, and all of the others who are part of this, part of this, this consideration of James Joyce and his work. Uh, the foundation, I think, is uh, so important. And as I have been saying, it's a great pleasure to be uh, in Rome. I always uh, feel from those previous existences I had, I was Minister for Culture around the time of the death of Fellini. So I would say Fellini's room as well. I'm delighted to be here. The foundation which had its inauguration in 2006 is a great and commendable model of collaboration and cooperation among students and scholars. And I think that the idea that the conference rotates between Dublin, Belfast, and Rome uh, is a great example. And it's a privilege for me to address you in the context that highlights the vitality of Irish studies in Italy and in an area of academic endeavor that is very close uh, to my own heart. It's a pleasure to know that here at Roma Tre University, you have a dedicated, established, an established center for research on Irish studies. I've been speaking about Irish studies in Liverpool, and been speaking about Irish studies in Sao Paulo, and my own view is that there is a new future opening up for Irish studies, that it will be very multidisciplinary, and that will allow new materials and provide great opportunities uh, for uh, new and young scholars. I also think as well that the work in this regard by pioneers such as Dr. Patrick O'Sullivan and others has been very important. I want to wish all of those who are working, researching and studying at the Center for Interdepartmental Research on Irish and Scottish Studies. How well James Joyce would have appreciated that acronym, CRISIS. Uh, I think it might have been alarming to some, uh, but I think that it is very important in another way. I am offering my few words at a conference at a time in Europe when I believe a great number of things are crumbling, and some perhaps for the better. Old and useless models of connection between economy and society indeed based to derive from, rooted in a form of extreme individualism that offered neither the democracy of the state nor the participation of citizens. I think all paradigms crumble with benefit at times. It is a time, therefore, when the prevailing assumptions have been questioned, that it is always artists that are in the vanguard of change and renewal. And that certainly was the historical context for so much of the work of James Joyce. I think as well this week's conference, which celebrating as it does the birthday of James Joyce, I think that 2013 has a, an enticing set of events uh, that are quite remarkable. This university is hosting a wonderful two days on Flann O'Brien in June. And Therese Liam Lefwishen, a Gascoim Gakrahari, I wish you success in that, in both languages, as Flann O'Brien would have done. Uh, 
Rome, home to Joyce, as indeed it was, uh, for a short, if not particularly happy time in his life, uh, was of course not the only Italian-speaking world with which he was acquainted. I'm delighted to hear that Trieste and the connection with Joyce, which has been so uh, wonderfully charted by Professor McCourt, among others, that Trieste, so beloved of Joyce, will welcome back Joyce scholars for the 17th time in its renowned summer school. May I extend my congratulations to Laura Palacio for her direction of that imaginative program. I'm also very pleased as President of Ireland that the University of Perugia will be hosting the Irish Studies Conference this year and that there is a lively interest in Irish literature in universities right throughout Italy. In universities such as Bologna, Firenze, Milan, Palermo, Cesare, Torino, Trento, as well as Rome and Trieste. Joy studies are thriving, even if the euro is in disarray. In universities, in those universities, the fact that Joy studies are in fact recording such interest is in no small part due to the dedication and hard work of very many of you in this room. Joy studies here in Italy have a very distinguished pedigree, and indeed a rightly tribute has already been paid to the legacy of the late Professor Giorgio Melchiore, a friend and mentor of so many people who are interested in Joyce studies and in Irish literature, in literature in general. And it is a testament to Frank and John and the other members of the board of the foundation that Joyce studies have never been more valuable. So congratulations are also due uh, to those who represent a new and exciting generation of scholars. And not only of scholarship, but as I feel, and I'll say a word about it in a moment, of emancipatory thought. I'm thinking in particular of the inspired translation into Italian of Ulysses by Enrico Terranone, formerly of this university and a graduate of University College Dublin and who shares a friendship with, my, with, Declan, and, uh, with Declan Kybert and myself. His is a great achievement and one recognized by critics and readers alike. And as president, I congratulate him on the prestigious Premio Napoli, which was awarded for a translation of the most complex and intricate of texts. It is a great testament to Enrico's skill and to the enduring relevance of Joyce's contribution to literature. And as an author myself, I congratulate him that the book has sold out in its sixth edition. We do not have to search long to understand why Irish studies are so popular and growing here in Italy, and why Italy holds such a special place in Irish hearts. There are some old reasons. Any study of Ireland, past or present, would have had a substantial chapter on our long-standing relationship with each other between Ireland and Italy. There is the rich texture of ecclesiastical relations between Ireland and Rome. I think the contribution that was made by Ireland to Italy's rich medieval heritage by such as Columbana, Simbobbio, Arcataldo and Taranto are stories that are a, million and a, a millennium and a half years old. More recently in the 17th century, as the great chieftains of the Gaelic world fled or left or were dispossessed and the beginning of the end of the Celtic world began, driven from their homeland, they found refuge here in Rome. And I am looking forward tomorrow to visiting the burial places of Hugh O'Neill and Rory O'Donnell in the church of San Pietro in Monterio. And then there is the liberator himself, Daniel O'Connell, who died at the height of the Irish famine in 1847, a famine which broke his heart. And again, I'm looking forward to visiting his tomb here in Rome. However, thinking about what I would say in these different forays I make back to universities now that I am no longer regularly giving lectures, uh, I thought uh, uh, the area with which I am most familiar has to do with exile and migration. 
the title I have chosen from my few words are that Irish, I think it is really, I feel that I should say something about the greatest exile we've had. So I'll speak about Irish studies and the significance of exile and the migratory experience. Both Ireland and Italy are countries that are long defined by a history of immigration, of separation and loss and memory and the construction of memory. And today both countries are able to look more comprehensively at the loss of so many young people. And at times, I think the literature concentrates on the attendant grief in our natural consciousness. But conversely now too, the positive effects of the exilic tradition on our capacity to endure, adapt, and modernize. And those of us in Ireland have to draw distinction between involuntary migration and those who have chosen the condition of exile or migration to establish a distance between themselves and that which they would wish to understand or contest their own country. We have both Ireland and Italy large scattered families who have made their lives in other people's lands, while at the same time retaining deep ties of affection for their countries of origin. Our diasporic communities not only promote our respective cultures through what they remember all over, from all over the world, but they continually make it anew and they extend it through their migratory experience. And we're fortunate to have such dynamic Italian and Irish communities who are our unofficial ambassadors wherever they gather. I know of Italian families who go back to near Monte Cassino, where very few people live in a small village, but from which they have a memory of their families migrating a long time ago. And they have an Irish week. And there are again Irish people in different parts of the world who do something similar. My own family are a family that have migrated, emigrated, migrated over many years. Early in the 19th century, my father's aunts and uncles to Australia. Then again, my uncle and aunt to Australia in the late 19th century, my sisters to England. And I myself have made many migrations, some long and some short. And when I began to study this subject for the first time, it was looking at African migrations and realizing the significance of circulatory migrations. And indeed, as a sociologist, it changed my thinking completely. I was struck by the degree to which the migrant experience, the experience of transience, is eschewed from sociological theory. It was as if an epistemological prejudice and a sense of method that derived from it, couldn't handle people without property, on the move, continually having to invent and reinvent themselves in strange and new circumstances, neither determined by the point of origin, nor totally absorbed by the values of the point of destination. So the subject of migration has inter interested me all throughout my academic and political career. As a university teacher and researcher in Ireland, I was struck on my return from abroad, particularly from the United States, of the exclusion of the migratory reality from sociological theory. I was fascinated the degree to which I myself and others were invited to accept models of society derived from structural functionalism that assumed a kind of stability, a consensual stability, which couldn't handle conflict. I recall the article of a colleague of mine at the time, Orlando Falls Borda, the ideological classes of North Americans studying South America, which would have invited those of us to regard those struggling for land in South America as deviants to the consensual order of the day. 
that model of society, Darfur wasn't able to handle land conflict in Ireland, no more than it could handle the tenement life of Dublin or all of the different exclusions that prevailed in Ireland, both pre-independence and post-independent. Models that were overdetermined, derived from structured functionism, as I have said, evolutionary too in their assumptions in relation of progression from what was called tradition to modernity. Irish social science privileged the sedentary. Therefore, those on the move, those without poverty, are left out of the explanatory models. But over on the other side, where Irish writers were writing, the migrant experience was being written about, if it was regarded by the sociological theory derived from abroad as exotic, more usually as deviant and occasionally as sentimental. Yet in the novels of Patrick McGill, in the writing in Irish and in English of Donald Macaulay, or in the plays of Tom Murphy and Brian Friel, and in the later work of John McGarren, you could read of the destructive ingress of economy, and you could read as well of the conflicts, conflicts that couldn't be catered for by a kind of epistemology of order. And I haven't time now, but in other pieces of writing I've written about how the two great Teens that dominated post famine Ireland of land in the end of the 19th century and respectability as we achieved independence would come to dominate, if you like, the teaching of the social sciences in a particularly conservative way. I think if I say, therefore, that in Miguel and Macaulay and Murphy and McGarren, you have a story that was missing from the social sciences. It is not to say that I'm advocating the ransacking of literature for evidence for sociological explanation. Oh no, rather what I am saying is that if Irish sociology, no more than Indian sociology, had been able to break away from its colonized matrix and had drawn on either aesthetics in the Indian case or phenomenology in the European case, we would have been better able to offer versions of understanding ourselves within the social sciences. I've written elsewhere how if a different road had been taken, we would have been open to the suggestive hypotheses that flow from qualitative materials. If, as I have said, phenomenological turn had been taken instead of the structural function. And therefore, it is to the literature I turn when I want to experience the transience that is at the heart of the migrant experience. An experience of transience that is not reducible to factors of explanation, as I have said already, at the point of origin or the point of destination. Some years ago, this was so strongly brought home to me when I read John Berger's The Seventh Man. When I look, for example, and how a book without words, with just images, give a construction of home and destination, how it can illustrate a fantastic version of both home and origin, as photographs are exchanged on the building site of the village from which you came, or equally of the block in Brussels that is being built as one exchanges this image with migrant workers from Turkey. This version of existence in transience, without property, and without the assurances of the sedentary, within the imagination, that is necessary for survival in an atmosphere of strangers. Necessary, too, if one is to deal with new arrivals, the ritual journey to the railway station, to see who has come from your village, or to rehearse the return home, which may never take place. These are rehearsals of the return, which take on a character that is massive, that abstract, and even mystic. It is to that, it is so, I think that migrant realities, therefore, have never really been given their place in social theory, and I think that it is no accident. But equally, beyond the social side, the sociological theories, I think it has, neither has it happened in law. 
and surely it is even more importantly that it has to be recognized in law. I believe that our migratory experiences should continually remind us that if we are for real about human rights to which you have referred and which took up some part of my own life, will then the human rights attach to each person from the fact of being simply human and alive and willing to experience and exchange dignity, that that should never be diminished or disregarded by necessity or the decision to move, to be forced to move, should never be curtailed, limited, or made conditional, or whether an individual remains in his or her place of birth or migrates to another country. In the end, as James Joyce so powerfully told us, we are all simply migrants in time, curious, creative, and vulnerable in an interdependent world that is fragile, that is always on the edge, too, of new possibilities yet to be realized. And as the scholars and students in this room will be very well aware, in his life and work, James Joyce embodied both the experience and the sensibility of the migrant. In fact, that exilic experience and migratory perspective was fundamental to his creative genius. My friend Professor Teklan Kaibert pithily put it when he said, one of those, that he said that Joyce was one of those migrants who create newness out of the mutations of the old. And what an achievement it was to break open the mold of the novel and not only put an end to the suggestion that a novel requires the backdrop of empire, but in fact, to create an entirely new form out of the very stuff of transience. And Kybert put it too, even more strongly when he said that Joyce knew from personal experience that to be modern is to experience perpetual disintegration and renewal, and yet somehow to make a home in that disorder. Such lived modernity is the project of our most famous cosmopolitan migrant, Leopold Bloom, who, while staying within and experiencing his city, despite all of its insults, its phony but intimately rewarding pretensions towards respectability, its nationalism that is discredited by the racism which burns at its heart, migrant Bloom shows compassion to the younger man who may need to put the mark of exile itself on his migration as he makes his run for freedom, however illusory. And I think, really, when you think of Stephen, as Carver describes it, at the start of Ulysses, Stephen suffers from a self-inflicted wound. He is lonely, depressed, and melancholy, mainly because, like so many, intellectuals formed at the end of the 19th century in the 1890s. He has chosen art over life. Overdeveloped in intellect, he is undeveloped in, in, in the emotions. And thus we have the insignificance of his encounter with Leopold Bloom and his celebration of the senses. Irish writers have not only had a long history then, of drawing on and using the experience of exile. They've been cited by South American writers as having not only broken away from the restrictions imposed by their own historical experience of colonization and the loss of a native language in the 19th century, but of taking the new vernacular of English, capturing it and fundamentally changing it, not only in a literary sense, as exemplified by Joyce and others, but at a general level in popular discourse, as people in rural areas played with the idea of polysyllabic words in the new language, mocking and being ironic, but also celebrating its usage. That vernacular was necessary if one needed to contest an eviction or dispossession. It was needed for dealing with the law. It was needing, need, needed for dealing with clearances, and it was re needed for dealing with the reading of the letter from America. 
The Irish writing from America, from exile too, it has sought at times to break away from inherited forms of authoritarianism, clericalism, or such a narrow nationalism but that had used a rhetoric of freedom but had delivered the reality of repression and restriction of the imagination as would happen in Ireland in the 20s and the 30s. Establishing a distance from Ireland then was not only a methodological strategy, it was an attempt, I suggest, at emancipatory realism. And as Declan Kuyvert again would argue, Leopold Bloom's cosmopolitanism is not that of a bohemian, but of a critically aware citizen who has balanced the promise and the burden of the past with what is necessary to live a full life of the census, and hence his difficulties in the flux of a change that did not offer freedom in its fullest human sense. It has been a feature, too, of the Irish writer in exile to live in both the old and the new world. In a piece which Declan Carver and I wrote in 1997, nearly 20 years ago, and published a new Hibernian review, we put it as follows. This attempt by the Irish mind to live in both the old and the new worlds at the same time explains the awesome formal complexity of much of its 20th century culture. It accounts for the willingness of artists to take extreme liberties with the forms of English literature, to improvise, as Jorge Luis Borges observed, without superstition and without undue deference to that important tradition. Borges likened the freedoms taken by Latin American artists with Spanish literature to Irish experiments with English form. If freedom could not be won in them, it would have to be won from them. The same forces underlay Joyce's unprecedented blend of the magical and the realist narrative modes in Ulysses, which allowed the mythical and mundane to coexist at the same time, at the same order of event. And Joyce's modernism was as much then an anticipation of Marquez and Rushdie as of Mann and Eliot. He used myth as a means of criticizing the limits of European realism as a chronicle of bourgeois life. And he simultaneously used realism to expose the limits of ancient myth-making. Central to Joyce's project was the conviction that more was gained than lost in the act of translating Homer into the terms of contemporary life. The story of Irish writing is that in Ireland we are not trapped in a static past, but welcome its constant revisions. We are happy to continuously wrestle with the challenges posed within the ethics and politics of memory. We are, for example, now again on the threshold of the centenaries of events that shaped Ireland for much of the last hundred years. This year we celebrate the centenary of the great lockout in Dublin, that major confrontation between the nascent movement, labor movement in Ireland, and organized business interests, determined to assert their economic and social hegemony. In the next few years, we will mark the centenary of the start of the first war, world war, and the events that led to the Easter Rising, the War of Independence, and the Civil War. The anniversaries are an opportunity for us to reflect on our complex identities. Sometimes it seems, as the 20th century progressed, that anxious for pragmatic assurances of stability, we sacrifice some of the powerful, emancipatory, egalitarian, and imaginative richness of the independence to which we aspired a century earlier. Perhaps, as Kybert puts it, war and civil war in Ireland had drained all energy and imagination away, so that there was little left with which to reimagine the national condition. And in addition, the polarizing of events of 100 years ago in Ireland had the effect in many respects of fixing and freezing national and religious identities for the decades that followed, in a way that was exclusive and confrontational, narrowing our horizons, substituting ritual for even the spiritual. 
we have set about the task then of dissolving these frozen certainties with some success. But I think also Irish writers, many in exile, have reminded us of the enduring luminosity of the original Republican vision, a vision that knows no borders in its liberating tendency. And Joyce, of course, did not wait until the post-independence state of torpor and disappointment had been reached before he left Ireland. His prescience about the drift of events impelled him to leave long before the Republican dream atrophied under the dead hand of conservative influences. The recovery of then and respect for the complexity of the evolution of Irish identity has enormous liberating potential. It is the reason why scholars who are advancing in Irish studies have such a vital role to play in reimagining an Irishness which is generous, inclusive, and as Bloom would tell us, life enhancing. It is of course of interest to me too how we in Ireland and other smaller countries are able to become involved in this task of the ethics of memory. And at the same time, our countries, so many countries, who have, if you like, an elaborate experience of empire, are reluctant to investigate the empire as it has survived within themselves and the consequences and legacy of the ruins of empire in their contemporary discourse. The Irishness that I believe is now emerging, even if not fully realized, is one that will be informed by scholarship from abroad, by the experience of Irish abroad, as much and even to a greater extent than it will be informed by those of us who live in Ireland. Distance grants perspective, and it is not accidental that so many of our most perceptive scholars choose the lens of temporary exile. And our people of Ireland are once at home and abroad. And in the case of Joyce, that perspective was so perceptive and so imaginative and so daring that I suggested transform modern literature. Joyce's decision to opt for exile was motivated by a desire to mediate between Ireland and the world. However, even more important was his wish to reveal and explain Ireland to itself, as he put it. Dubliners, for instance, was a brilliant depiction of Ireland at a moment in transition between colonial stasis and national independence. That independence evolved over time and was perhaps given fuller expression, and I come to my own contemporary existence and the modern period. Ireland joined the European unit community 40 years ago in 1973. Ireland, in the contemporary period, is a strong supporter of the concept of an ethically based European Union, derived and developed from the principles of the founding treaties, treaties that sought to create an enduring peace in place of war, wars often impelled by the interests of voracious empires. The European project was not to be simply the absence of war, but the fruits of peace were to be made available in a union of equals in a cohesive way. It was an inspiring suggestion to speak of a flowering of cultures within Europe too. Now all of you are no doubt aware, by now Ireland currently holds the presidency of the Council of European Union. And I am happy to be in Italy at the invitation of the President of Italy, President Neapolitano. This is the seventh occasion that we've had this honor in Ireland. It comes at a time when we celebrate the 40th anniversary of Ireland's accession, as I have said. So how appropriate then that I'm speaking to you here in Rome, a city so centrally associated with the European project. And it is the place where Ireland's instrument of accession to the founding Treaty of the Union was deposited. And we are conscious in Ireland of the opportunities that the presidency offers. The priorities for our presidency are urgent and compelling. Jobs, <laughs> stability, sustainable growth. And these are matters that matter to all of us Europeans. And we believe in the Irish presidency that if we are to restore confidence in the values of the European idea, 
an idea that offered us unprecedented peace and that delivered for us peace, stability and prosperity. We must pursue the principles in the original treaties. We draw inspiration from the pioneers of the European project, Robert Schumann, Jean Monnet, and of course, Altiero Spinelli, whose early vision was an inspiration for an evolving gender towards an ever-closing union. But we are now facing even more challenging times. Would we remember that they, in their day, faced such challenges with new ideas, abandoning old and destructive models? I think we have a common purpose in seeking to create a social Europe and holding to that purpose by working through our present problems. And that in doing so, we will be helping the Union, still young in historic terms, beyond empire, to emerge stronger and wiser. We've traveled an extraordinary journey together. And the key lesson is that our problems and our economic challenges are best tackled together through an effective and unified response. And Ireland recalls and celebrates the transforming possibilities of European Union membership, not only in social and economic terms, but in terms of culture. As an old European nation, we reach back to the contribution that was made in the 17th century. But as president of Ireland, I also say, there is a world that is yet to be born. There is a world of the imagination to which Europe can contribute and offer as partner and as equal in the wider world. I think that while European governments may be preoccupied with regenerating the economy, with stabilizing the currency, the banking system, it is important we never lose sight of the wider vision of Europe, envisaged by those founding members in the treaties, a vision that not only valued peace, as I have said, but the values of a shared, the fruits of a shared peace. I think that in facing these, in getting to a new place, as it would be put in modernist writing, the difficulties of Europe and the wider world economic space have to be addressed, including the making of a sufficient critique of the models and assumptions that have brought us this disastrous situation of a Europe scarred by such high levels of unemployment, particularly youth unemployment. Yes, we have to look, indeed, as you say, as ex extreme individuals in the face. We have to receive how it came to be the base of a speculative model that suggested a growth based on inflation of property values could be a viable version of economic growth, even if such never existed in any literate reading of economic theory or policy. We must recognize that the breach of trust of institutions by banks that put speculative gains above citizen welfare. We must realize that a new direction, one that might have been originally approved of in the founding treaties, is where we must go. To conclude what I have to say, I can tell you that Ireland is currently undergoing a period of significant economic readjustment. And we appreciate the support of Italy and other European partners at this time. We draw on extraordinary levels of community solidarity and creativity in challenging times. And in the cultural area, it is always where the new thinking is most manifest. In March 2011, there was a huge reception to the new that Dublin had been designated a UNESCO city of literature, a celebration of Joyce's city. Galway City, seeking to join Sydney and Bradford, which, are twin, which is twin to Galway, as a UNESCO designated city of film, was equally received with enthusiasm. The Irish are turning to their strengths, which are very much in the cultural area, but also the creativity in the cultural area is a creativity that offers promise in every area of Irish life, including institutions and the economy. I referred earlier to Joyce's Dubliners. The Abbey Theatre's production of the dead had one actor who featured in John Huston's magnificent film at adaptation in 1987. Ingrid Craigie played the role of the dutiful niece, Mary Jane Morkan, and on the Abbey stage recently, she embodied Aunt Kate. And so many of those participants who made, who brought Joyce to us, Donald McCann, 
Donald Donnelly, Mary Keane and Dan O'Hurley, as well as the tenor Frank Patterson, and John Huston himself, the director, while each of these artists main the words of the story, have become shades. Their art lives on to enrich the lives of the living. And indeed, to finish where I began, it is quite significant that the master of whom the dead was directed by an American of Irish descent, and that a number of the actors were also American, even with a strong Irish lineage and connections. And there is an interesting symmetry in that a book about Dublin written in Italy by an Irish author who had self-consciously chosen exile is interpreted for the cinema by an American who later renounced US citizenship and became a citizen of Ireland. And in the modern time, the recent Abbey production is directed by Joe Dowling, who lives and works most of the time in the United States. And that shows us the capacity of Irish literature in general, and Joyce's work in particular, to migrate beyond borders from one culture to another, and in the process to offer enriching interpretations that offer us new, liberating, emancipatory versions of Irishness. On a number of occasions since my inauguration, as Oak President of Ireland, I have suggested that it is not only from memory that the Irishness of a new departure will come, but from what is imagined as possibility and capable of being fraught to fruition. And this will not be a new task or a novel experience for Irish people. But for Ireland, is not a society that has simply moved out of tradition into modernity. Irish people have again and again been required to modernize, to adapt, to learn, and to come through with the creativity needed to comprehend and deal with the challenge of the moment. That process of adaptation and modernization was a particular feature of the Irish migrant experience as they sought to accommodate the strangeness to the strangeness of their host communities. The migrant experience and our diasporic tradition are fundamental parts of the Irish identity, in the same way that our literature cannot be fully understood without taking into account the exilic perspective which Joyce embodied. As president of Ireland, Maruk Tronahan, my interest and concern is not just for the body of Irish citizens who live in Ireland, but for the wider Irish community across the globe. And the fact that modern communications allows that global Irish community in all its diversity and, disper and dispersion, to constantly connect and communicate with its various strands presents a rich seam of opportunity in economic and social, in, in social terms. This year, the Irish government has designated 2013 as the year of the gathering to welcome home our Irish abroad as well as friends of Ireland. The celebrations are underway across the country, and it is a great time to come home to Ireland. But wherever the Irish are gathered, and wherever people who are interested in Ireland are gathered, many who will not be able to come home, I hope they too are celebrating. And I'm very, very conscious that for many who may find it difficult to come back, it may be a dream. But I hope that they will have the opportunities to celebrate, which is very, very valuable to my presidency. And I well know that as well as the literary her heritage of which I have been speaking, that also at this conference, Irish music, film and dance will enjoy universal appeal. Among Ireland's greatest resources are our art, literature, and culture. They give meaning, depth, and texture to Irish life. They enhance our reputation abroad beyond the, red, the storms of speculation, and they facilitate our engagement with the world. Those of us who value the importance of Irish studies and in particular the importance of its accessibility and participation, owe a deep debt of gratitude to scholars and to their academic institutions. And all of us in Ireland are grateful for the interest taken in our country by the James Joyce Italian Foundation, by those of you involved in the Crisis Centre, and indeed each of you who study our literature, our arts and culture, in your respective universities and in your homes, your reflections and perspectives on us, and on our writers old and new, enable us to understand ourselves with greater breadth and depth of insight. And the papers that will be presented, and I've looked at them, over the next two days, are a fine illustration of that contribution, and a testament to the depth of the intellectual analysis underway. Scholarship has placed a vital role in the story of Ireland, 
and your scholarship continues this tradition in inspiring new ways. I look forward to its fruits. I hope that you enjoy accompanying Ireland on its journey of renewal and reimagination. On Sauliak Tatar Shu. I wish you all a fulfilling and insightful conference, and I thank you for your work for bringing a wider international understanding of Irish culture. Garamila Mahakis Quimra Arur Upper. Thank you very much.